Annie is gonna Hi, everybody, um, and welcome back for another uh, Sharing Hope Community Conversation with NAMI. Uh, my name is Nimare. I am a um, volunteer um, peer advocate with NAMI, and I have two special guests with me today because it is September, the end of Suicide Awareness Month. Um, so we're just going to have a conversation about that very important but a sensitive um, topic. So I'm happy that we have, um, in addition to the wonderful uh, guests attending that you can see um, as well, we have two um, individuals who are trained professionals, because I am not one. Uh, I'm just here as a uh, to help bring resources together and as a peer advocate. Um, but we do have Norwood Coleman Jr. and Chantel Coleman with us. I'm going to let them each introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about them. Um, Chantel, would you like to start? Uh, sure. Uh, so I am Chantel Bratcher Coleman. I'm the CEO of Shaping Minds Therapeutic Services. Uh, we are a private practice outpatient mental health um, office located in Newark, Delaware. Uh, we are minority owned and operated. And we see children all the way up to older adults. We, we do trauma, substance abuse, um, we work with um, a few boys and girls clubs in Wilmington, and we are just here to be a resource to the community and whoever needs help. So we're here as a resource and to also provide therapy services. Great. Thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. Sure. Um, Norm or Norwood. Hi, I'm Norwood Coleman. And I'm also a, a licensed clinical social worker here in the Delaware area. Um, I'm the clinical uh, manager and training coordinator at the Life Health Center. We're uh, located up in uh, Wilmington area, actually. And um, a couple of things that we do, we provide, you know, uh, mental health services. Actually, we provide integrative health services. So we have medical health. Uh, mental health services, a um, substance abuse uh, program, and uh, we also do COVID testing and that sort of thing. Our 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 biggest uh, uh, arm of the organization is school based elementary and middle school based wellness uh, centers here in uh, the Christina School District, uh, and we've also worked. Uh, and the Colonial School District in the past for the, uh, over the past five years, but really our uh, aim is uh, prevention of uh, severe mental illness and uh, medical illness, and as well um, elimination of stigma. Great, I love that. Thank you so much, and thank you again both for joining us. I know that this is such a sensitive but important topic. Um, it's actually something that I have dealt with in my lifetime. And it wasn't until we had our first Sharing Hope Community Conversations last year that I actually really spoke about it. I've spoken about it a little bit, but it's a hard, it's a hard subject to talk about because I think that even if you're someone who has um, attempted it and is blessed to still be here, you sort of feel like there's some judgment mm -hmm. for, on you from others for even, even going that route. And um, it's, it's, it can be very difficult to explain um, to others what, what that's like and you know, how it gets to that point. Um, but just starting you know, way back from, not way back, but uh, from, the, uh, from the beginning, um, I, was, I was 13. So I know that a lot of times with teenagers, um, that's often when mental illness starts to show signs of it. Um, but it's also the time where people are dealing with just being a teenager. Um, so what are some possible signs that people can look for um, in that age range, um, you know, the teen years that maybe like it may be time to speak to someone or to reach out to someone or to say something? As far as um, the, the teenagers themselves or the families? Um, let's start with the, um, the families. Okay. Um, I think one of the things that around that age, um, and, and it's hard to, 
it's hard to notice it a little bit more now because a lot of kids, it's social media, so they already isolate because you can be in your room, you can play video games, you can be on social media and be, you know, engulfed in that for hours and you might not see people in the household and things like that. Um, but I think when you start to see that your child is isolating more than usual, or maybe before they were like, when you would go places, they would want to go, or you would see them with certain friends or always on the phone. Like when things start to change in their patterns, I think it's really important to, to just ask, a, you know, ask questions and kind of see if, if everything is okay, if anything new is going on. Um, I know with social media, there's a, a lot of cyber bullying that kids will deal with. So maybe asking questions around that. Um, you know, some parents have a good uh, hold on their kids' social media where they go in and they check behind them. And then some parents are a little bit more lenient and don't want to kind of check up on their kids. So, you know, that's going to be a conversation to have if you're not going to actually be going through their messages and checking that way. But um, I just think constantly checking in is something that's really important and, and noticing because we're, you know, as adults, we're kind of wrapped up in our own things. And a lot of times we miss certain signs and you might go back a week or two later and say, well, I did notice that something was a little off, you know, and, and, you know, we, we get caught up in our own issues and mental health concerns ourselves. So just kind of being present. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very true. And, you know, I like that you mentioned talking to them and asking them questions. I think something that people really hesitate from, especially when it comes to suicide, uh, we hear frequently like, oh, I don't want to put the idea in their head, which is the exact opposite, I think, of how it how it works. Um, Nora, could you speak a little bit more to the importance of having those conversations? And does it plant that seed in their head just by mentioning it? Yeah, so uh, absolutely not. It doesn't plant the seed. I think actually it does just the opposite. It plants the seed of hope when we actually have those conversations. I mean, uh, everyone knows about modeling. Everyone uh, understands that, you know, most of us, many of us are, you know, hands-on learners. You know, we want to you know, we want to see somebody else do it before we might give it an attempt. And for parents, one of those simple ways to do that is to introduce the conversation, is to ask the question, hey, have you thought about suicide? Have you considered killing yourself? It's a tough question to ask until we realize that many people have asked it of themselves in silence. One of the beautiful things about asking the question is that it demonstrates that, you know, we have uh, the ability uh, to talk about a thing and not uh, be as fearful of it. When we think about uh, eliminating stigma, one of the beautiful ways that we can do that is just to talk about a thing and bring it into the room and know that we're safe enough to hold the space for our children. Um, I was talking to someone the other day and often uh, they were saying, you know, well, I'm not a therapist. And so I don't know how to have these conversations. And I was reminded that, you know, um, you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic um, for people, uh, which is to be a place where healing and safety and nurturance is always growing. Um, having those conversations, being able to say, being able to ask. Um, and one of the ways I do it, because I ask, I've been asking even little kids um, um, from time to time, and they may look at you kind of curious, like, why are you asking that? because it's not a common question. And my answer is really simple. And I think it's really helpful for parents to be able to explain why they're asking sometimes is to be able to say, you know, I'm asking because I care about your thoughts. I care about your feelings and I care about your well-being. So I ask. Um, often, some, so I think sometimes when we ask the question for the first time or hear it, we think that we're making an accusation. It's not an accusation, it's a question. Um, and we and it's an invitation to the conversation and we always want to invite our children and our families a little closer into our arms yes absolutely and you know as we as we talk about that you know that advice can be given to any any parent out there um but especially since we are in you know sharing hope um just focusing a little bit more on the on the black community um and our children uh there was a a recording or article about the um, 
behind the suicide rates, what's behind the suicide rates um, for young black youth. And I know that we've been dealing with a lot of racial trauma and it's stuff that we've been dealing with forever. Um, and in some ways, I think it's great that we're talking about so much of it more, um, not just behind closed doors, but really like putting it out there. But then at the same time, I feel like putting it out there um, makes it more pressing for them and more aware of it for them. Um, what role do you think like this seemingly never ending racial trauma, like what, do you, what role do you think that that has played in the uptake in suicides amongst uh, black youth? Um, and either of you can answer that. Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that our kids are starting to be exposed to situations that I think it, like at my age, I'm almost 40. Like we would hear about these things, like the, the older generations would kind of tell us about these things. We would hear, we might not have experienced it ourselves, but we would constantly hear about racial issues and things like that from our elders. And I think that with our youth, they don't necessarily have that same connection with the elders, but they're now seeing everything in media. So it's like, you, you're no longer able to hide it. Like be, before, like you would hear racial stuff and it's like, oh, I've heard of that before, but you haven't seen it for yourself. And I think now, you know, I, I think it's a constant trigger with our youth and our adults, right? Like it's a constant trigger. It's like, okay, I've dealt with that before, but I'm okay. Or we'll tell ourselves that. And then you'll keep seeing something on TV that, that speaks to that experience. And it's like, you're traumatized over and over and over. So where you thought you were okay, you start to realize maybe I'm not okay. And maybe, maybe my situation was a lot worse than I thought it was. And now I see that other people are going through it. So then that really gives you this, this sense of like, it, this might not get better. This is constantly going to be a problem. And, and, you know, when something feels like it's definitely going to be an issue, then it's like, I don't know if I want to deal with this for the rest of my life. I, I dealt with it in one situation, but I'm constantly going to have to deal with someone mistreating me or not liking me because of my race or being intimidated by me. And that's a lot of pressure at a, at a young age. It's a lot of pressure as an adult when you go through um, the different racial concerns. It, it's, it's very traumatic to go through that. And, you know, some of us have the tools to be able to deal with it. And then, and some of us, you know, we, we're, we're not as strong to be able to just continue to bear the, the, um, the frustration that comes with it, the embarrassment, the, I mean, there's so many feelings that come along with being mistreated because of race. Some of us aren't able to handle that. And especially the youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you make such a great point because it is, it's things that we've talked about in the, in the past, but now you, we see it constantly. And I know for me, um, sometimes like my depression is triggered not so much by like my personal feelings, but just by like a general sense of like hopelessness about the world, because it can start to feel like it's never going to get better. Like yeah. everywhere you look, every country has destruction and there's bad people everywhere. And it's just like, well, what is the point, you know? Um, so if you're already living with those thoughts or feelings and now you constantly have the media just like pouring it in, I have to personally give myself days where I just can't be on social media. Like I just need a day off because, um, and there's a meme where it's like, you're constantly in the battle between wanting to keep your sanity and wanting to know what's going on because right. you don't want to just close your eyes to what's happening in the world, but sometimes opening your eyes to what's happening in the world can really make you feel better and sometimes for your own sake and your own mental health, you have to shut yourself off to that. Right, right. Um, and now speaking from the viewpoint of, um, you know, like a teen going through it, um, what's something that, or how would they be able to um, reach out or express that they think, or if they think that what they're dealing with is more than just normal, like teenage angst, because a lot of times adults can be dismissive of teens, like, oh, you know, you're just, just emotions, just, just your teenage hormones. Um, so if a teen feels like they're going through something or it might be deeper than that, like what are some tips that they can, um, or tips or tools that they can use to, to reach out and get help? I mean, I think one of the 
uh, for most teens, I think we give social media uh, a bad rap sometimes. Um, and social media is the platform in which kids, you know, live in. It's it's not my reality; it's their reality. I don't. Uh, they have a future that I'll never see. And you know, there are a lot of uh, online uh, uh, resources uh, like the lifelines, um, uh, the lifelines uh, uh, talk line, uh, uh, which I'll put the. Um, actual number in there in the chat for everyone so that they can see it. Um, I don't have it memorized in my head, it's in my phone. Uh, uh, Annie's uh, great, she probably add it. And she did also add. Yep, the, there it is. Yep. Oh, Annie has it. Annie's all, yeah, there you go. Thank you. It, yeah. Annie's always on it. Thank you, Annie. And then also one of the things I think about is that there's, yeah, the, um, yeah, so that's the text line. And then also in most schools now, um, excuse me, in most schools, there's uh, uh, in middle schools, there's a behavior health consultants. We have family crisis therapists in um, most of the elementary schools. Uh, all schools have a school counselor. Uh, any teacher really um, in a school, uh, we forget that um, uh, also uh, there are uh, a lot of adults in the community. Community centers are places where children often go. Coaches are a tremendous resource. Uh, particularly uh, school coaches that are often school teachers. Uh, so they have those resources. They uh, have trainings like uh, some of the uh, trainings that NAMI has done, like mental health birthdays and that sort of thing. And they're able to speak, they're able to know the signs. And I think one of the things that's important is just a child being able to say, hey, you know, I'm, this is how I feel. Even if you can't say how you feel, this is, I, I, I don't want to feel this way, you know. Um, and being able to say, hey, help seeking is a really difficult thing. And it's not always taught. Um, but one of the things people are able to do is to be able to, are able to say, hey, um, just to approach a person, uh, uh, so, some of those safe people that we talked about, some of those safe lines, those anonymous places, um, and be able to uh, pick up the phone and just say, hey, um, I, need, I need a little bit of uh, support. Yeah. And, you know, and you make a great point that social media is also a good thing. I, I'm always on social media. I love social media. I'm a social media alcoholic um, because I also like that you can very much create the world you want to see. So for me, like I know those times where I'm starting to feel overwhelmed by all the news that's coming in and it being bad. Like I will purposely go and like, like pretty pictures, um, click on houses I'll never be able to afford. But the more I do that, the more I see that in my search page, um, which makes it a little bit better when I open it up. Um, and I did want to, so there's also an article um, addressing increasing suicide rates in the black community. And recently I was, I attended the NAMI national convention or the national conference. Um, and they had a speaker from the national, national, it's NAMI, the National Mental Institute, National Health Mental Institute. I know I'm missing a letter there, um, but they had a speaker um, and the statistics, it was, it was created to me. And the one thing that really stood out for me and this article actually brings it up as well. So I'll just read the numbers to you, but the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has been collecting national data on suicides occurring during the COVID pandemic um, and startling trends are surfacing specifically amongst black American. The CDC data shows 15% of black non-Hispanic respondents seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days compared to 8% of whites and 10% of all respondents. Data also shows 44% of black and non-Hispanic respondents reported more than one adverse mental or behavioral health symptoms compared to 38% of whites and 40% of um, respondents. Now, just hearing those numbers, it's like, oh, wow, you know, like 15 compared, 15 percent compared to 8 percent. But I remember being in the conference, looking at the graph, and it actually showed where like before amongst the different rates, our suicide rates were pretty much about the same. And then it's like COVID hit 
or part of the pandemic hit and you saw the numbers in white races go down and black go up. And it's, it's startling and it's so very sad to see that our suicide rates have gone up versus um, other rates or other, other races. What do you think is a main contributing, a contributing factor to that? Um, I, I noticed one of the things that I see a lot more um, over the last year and a half. So, so here at Shape and Minds, it started out that I was the only therapist here for two years. When COVID hit, we now have almost 10 staff, like between part-time and full-time hours, including our interns. And what I was starting to see with the Black population is a lot more people are coming into therapy because they're having issues with their jobs. So I think they had issues with their jobs before COVID hit. But once COVID hit, that um, whatever issues that they had with their job, lack of diversity, lack of support, um, it, it's like people that they were dealing with were starting to get a little bit bolder. They were starting to be a lot less supportive. Um, it, it was more about productivity. Like, you know, productivity now is like everything because companies are losing money and, and now they're, you know, now it's driven by uh, productivity. And so a lot of people are starting to um, feel the pressure of, you know, I might not have felt so distant at my job because I was black or, or because I was Latino, but now like there's definitely a difference. There's definitely more pressure on us. Um, a lot less respect, you know, uh, for our positions and what we do. And so I have a large population of minorities that are coming in because it's like, in order to maintain my mental health and my job, I need to talk to someone because this is getting to a point where it's just like blatant, um, you know, uh, racism and, and discrimination and things like that. And so, you know, for some reason with COVID, it, it, people like everybody's on edge. So I think be, before the people that were able to maintain their composure in certain positions and kind of hide some of their true feelings about others, like they're stressed out. So it's like now they're just kind of, you know, dealing with people how they how they really wanted to deal with people before because now they have no filter. Now they have no patience. So I, I think a lot of people are feeling that pressure. And, you know, I, it, unfortunately, our community is is being affected the most it seems like um by these situations and and so you know mental health concerns are rising you know job security is is um is lacking and you know people are just they're, they're starting to feel hopeless in these situations yeah, yeah. Oh, no go ahead Norma. No, I mean i was gonna say i think you hit the nail right on the head it's like the trigger of all triggers <laughs> you know, COVID-19 really just opened up, you know, the wounds have been there. Intergenerational trauma is exactly what it is. It's passed down, you know, for, um, I was telling somebody the other day that, you know, for many African-Americans, you would think that, honestly, Africa didn't exist until the first slave arrived. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not, it, 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 there's no context in this uh, country for many people to talk about it. And so the discussion is always the blaming of, uh, and the remind, the, the conversation often is the reminder of the degradation and um, uh, torture. Um, and the way that it's talked about often is not uh, um, talked about by African Americans. Um, uh, in ways that are useful, it's really kind of, you know, sort of a pity story, not an empowerment story. And then COVID, you know, as, as well as people have been struggling, managing all of that, their feelings, their families, et cetera, COVID-19 hits the economic strife, the social strife, the isolation, the fear uh, the, 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 the loss of control of the sense that I can actually be safe and, and, and healthy or even be by my loved ones in a community that is often noted for its um, a community uh, uh, cohesiveness and closeness. 
And so it was the, it's the trigger of all triggers. When you ask about why are we seeing this, you know, for many, I think for many uh, people in the black community, and I think in a lot of uh, marginalized communities, it was the straw, it's the straw that broke the camel's back. And um, I'm not hesitant to say that I don't know that there was a lot of notice or research for um, the suicide rates for African Americans in the past to really even be a comparison uh, uh, to be compared to in uh, uh, in in the ways that it could have been. Um, you know, African Americans have been dying at disproportionate rates for a variety of reasons um, for, you know, since the beginning of African Americans um, and particularly in this, in the past, you know, 30 years, um, you know, when we look at, you know, what suicide is called now and the definition, we also look, we now, we also now look at substance abuse and substance overdose, but that was not looked upon you know, in the past where African-Americans were dying left and right. I think that there's a, a, a combination of factors that lead into the numbers. I think what also is critically important about that is that someone's noticing that we're noticing. And as Chantel said, people are coming to counseling. They're actually seeing faces. For some people, it is critical and important to see a face that looks like their own. Um, because they're so fearful. Yeah. They're so fearful of what it, what they perceive it to be, what it used to be. There have not been images of African-Americans on television providing therapy or even being the client uh, in the ways that it has been um, you know, portrayed. And so people don't see themselves and so that it's difficult to imagine a future of hope so I think that what Chantel was also, had also mentioned was that people are, we're seeing people actually accessing healthcare differently. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a difficult thing to, to grasp because as people notice what's going on with them for the first time even, um, the, the feelings that they're having, they're overwhelming. Right. Yeah. I think that we are in a space where, especially with this pandemic, everyone's just sort of going, we're all going through it, right? And uh, there's always been a discrepancy between the um, mental health care received and taken care of, you know, by the different races. So like Blacks and African American versus uh, white races. I just think that when the pandemic happened and the quarantine happened, um, we thankfully on one level started talking about mental illness and mental health and how it's impacting us because more and more of us were feeling it. Um, but I think that given the fact that one of the biggest discrepancies um, or discrepancies between the two groups before was resources available, we still have that problem now. So great, everybody's admitting that they have a problem, but we still have one group that has a serious lack of resources. Um, it is nice, like some people didn't even realize their employers had mental health um, coverage for them where they could do a couple of sessions and more people are coming out and speaking out about that but there still is that group that didn't have the coverage before and they certainly aren't getting it now I think it's great that there's also a lot of therapists who are doing pro bono work and um, taking on clients and doing things like that um, but I also think that that's why things like this are so important so a people have a space to talk and also so they know that there are other resources out there and available for them. Um, we talked to, you know, a bit about the about the teens, the signs with them and noticing them. And I'm sure many of the signs are, are similar for the adults, but what are some what are some signs that you could look for in adults that you may not see necessarily when they're younger, but like when we're talking about adults and living their lives day by day, um, is there anything that you can to keep an eye out for um, to say like, oh, maybe I should speak to this person or address something with them? Um, yeah. Oh, you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Jen. Okay. <laughs> um, well, one of the things is a lot of people use social media. And sometimes I have to take a social media break because I, I don't know if it's normal um, because I'm a therapist or, or whatever. But I start to see some posts that I'm like, 
it's a little questionable about how somebody is explaining their feelings or um, like little comments that people are say or, or things that they might repost. Like sometimes you'll see something and you're like, that person is going through something, like something's mm. going on. And so um, I find myself inboxing people and I'm like, oh my gosh, they probably think I'm a creep. But like, sometimes <laughs> I'll see something questionable and I'm like, if I don't say something and then I see a post that this person harmed themselves, I'll feel bad for not mm -hmm. just offering, you know, to like, can, can I help you find some resources wherever you are? But I think a lot of times people, they ask for help. They don't come out and ask for help in a way that says, you know, I'm struggling and I need help, but they'll say things that you're, that, that are, you're like, why would you, why would you say that? You know, like you start to see things like that or, um, people that used to be dependable, all of a sudden you can't count on them anymore or someone that you might be able to get on the phone or get them to answer a text. Now it's like far in, in, in few between with phone calls and things like that. So you start to see different behaviors with this person or this person was always bubbly and happy and always spoke. And now all of a sudden they're kind of sticking to their cells and they don't have much to say. Um, or, or they're just flat out like, you know, just, just, they don't have the energy anymore. They're, um, they're hopeless. They're just, you know, they're not their normal selves as you know them. And you, like you said, with substance abuse, you start to see it, you, you know, you might see an increase in that, or maybe they never drank before and now they're starting to drink or, you know, or, or you know, um, a lot of behaviors that you used to, you know, see with them before, it's just like, this person is not themselves. And, you know, it might start out as something, some small things, but then some people make drastic changes and you really start to see some things where you're like, this person is not okay. And so, um, you know, it, it's just good to have conversations with people that just ask, asking them like, you know, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about? Do you have support? I think a lot of people, um, don't have support like you you see them with all these friends and you, especially with you know us having instagram and facebook it's like oh i, I think on facebook i have four thousand friends but the, the, when i'm going through something you know do i really have four thousand right. friends or do i even have five friends that i can reach out to so you assume that these people have all of these connections because you know it looks like they might have these connections but they might really be alone and so sometimes you just have to check in with people and just kind of see like, where are you right now? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, a lot of the therapist groups that I'm in, like I think we've gotten better as therapists saying I'm not okay, where I'll see like a therapist will post like, you know, I, I'm, I just need to let someone know I'm not okay. And we weren't even comfortable having those conversations and we do this for a living. I think mm -hmm. a lot of us are getting to the point where it's like, you know, we need to talk to somebody. I need somebody to understand where I'm at. So if, you know, it's a struggle for us, I can only imagine, you mm -hmm. know, for people that, that don't have, you know, the education, the training, the experience um, that we have going through that and not really knowing what to do with those feelings. So I, I think we, as a community, we have to pay attention more, you know, um, and, and that requires us looking outside of ourselves which in a time like this is very hard because we're all struggling with something right now. And so to have to look outside of you to pay attention to another person sometimes seems like too much, but they might be the support you need. You might be the support that they need. And, you know, I, I think we just have to care about each other more and, and notice each other. Yes, absolutely. Um, and were you gonna add something as well, Norwood? Yeah, no, I was going to add that, um, yeah, particularly in looking uh, in, in adults, because adults are a little bit different, you know, um, you know, and how they're going to express, um, they've been, they've been, adults have, have a lot more time to practice masking yeah. uh, their symptoms. Uh, um, so one of the things I think about is that you often, first of all, I like to just got to put this out there is that it's not the, the single drastic change that should raise alarm flags but it's you know it's really when you start seeing a pattern of of those changes that you know you may you know you can bring attention to it to the, you know but it's you know to check in the first time you notice it because you want to notice it 
but I, also we want to be mindful that it also it's it may have be re, in relation to a pattern of behaviors but i think about this is that anyone who's learned how to mask and we usually mask you know with our face and our what we say is that often it can come out through the body you know some of those changes uh people may you you, you know one of the things we saw for a lot of people, I think it was one of the big things during COVID-19, everyone's weight changed, you know? Um, and, you know, uh, but, you know, you know, some of those subtle things, weight change, you know, changing, you know, your, your, your drinking or your, uh, your drinking habits where I might have been a social drinker or uh, uh, all of a sudden now I'm at the bar or at the liquor store uh, a lot more often. Um, and, or people, you know, we, we know that relapse, you know, skyrocketed for people who were, um, uh, living a life, uh, that had, where they had captured some sobriety and, you know, so some of those, uh, but all, I think what Chantel really points out, and I think we're going to keep going back to this is that the ability to have the courage to, 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 to say something to someone and say that, you know, Hey, I care. And I noticed, uh, some changes that I'm going to walk with you to your supports, uh, not point you in the right direction, but I'm going to walk with you uh, is really, really important, particularly for adults. Adults have a lot more responsibilities now, and a lot more to juggle, um, just like everybody else, because they also have children. Um, that the, uh, Many of them that, you know, they're going to put, adults are going to put their children first uh, in many cases. Um, and you know, adults, you know, so they'll, they'll, they'll neglect themselves and will look at it as that sort of normal and overlook some of those really important signs, uh, like changes in their body, changes in their uh, ha drinking habits, changing in their changes in, um, you know, just their, their hygiene, uh, those kinds of things, uh, as well as changes in the kind of language and, 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 and themes that they're using in their conversation. Uh, not participating uh, as they used to in activities that they used to enjoy or not really even come, you know, connecting in conversation with people in the way that they, they have in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that, you know, when we talk about getting help, there's, you know, the resources and things, but there's also the stigma is a huge factor in it. And you mentioned earlier, um, Norwa, that, you know, African-American history didn't start when the first slaves came over. But I feel like so often we're sort of taught that. And because of that, there's this sense of like, just suck it up, deal with the struggle. Like being black is dealing with the struggle. Like that's part of your toughness, that's part of your strength. And I know like for me, like I can't even handle black trauma on my movies and TV shows anymore. Like if it's police brutality or slavery, like I just can't watch it right now. It's too much in the real world. I can't watch it on my screens. Um, but you know, like Africa is this whole, and I feel, I think I feel it even more strongly because I'm Liberian, I was born in Liberia. And it's like Africa is this whole continent. Like it's huge. You can fit the US and China and some other countries in it as well. It has this rich history of, you know, they have their own kings and queens and all of these like wonderful things. And we don't really hear about that. We hear about this little tiny pocket of their history um, in relation to trauma and coming over to yes and the trauma that has been endured since then. So there builds up this whole um, mentality of like, we're tougher than that, like mental illness. You know, um, NAMI did a, a study and they printed it in their article, but 63% of black people believe that mental illness condition is a sign of personal weakness. So even if those resources might be available to them, if 63% of them believe it's a sign of weakness, that means A, the people that they're talking with, they're telling, you know, like you can be stronger than that, you've got this. And then B, they're not going to seek out the help that they need themselves. And I'm always an advocate of therapy because um, you can be as introspective as you want and you can vent all you want to your friends, but they don't have the tools that therapists have to help you deal with certain thought patterns or deal with certain emotions and things. And mental illness is definitely something that um, we all have mental health, right? We all have physical health. So we all have mental health. And just like you need to see the doctor for upkeep and be aware of your physical health, you need to do the same thing for your mental health. And I know that it's just, it's so hard 
when you do have that stigma against you, that it is a, it is a sign of weakness. Um, so, you know, as we think about this month and um, suicide awareness, but not just this month, but just going forward as well, what are some ways to combat that stigma so that people can feel more comfortable either seeking help for themselves or reaching out for a family or friend? Um, I, I think people have to just start asking questions. Um, I, I find that a lot of times, like even with um, emails I might get through the website or um, people might inbox and just ask questions. Like I, I think as professionals um, and as advocates that we have to leave the door open for people to just ask questions. You know, like I think a lot of times people think when they call a therapy office, it's like, if I call, like I'm going to end up in therapy. And it's like, no, you can call and just ask questions. I know like my, my, my mom um, takes all the calls that come into our office. And like a lot of those calls that will come in will be, you know, just like general questions. Well, one of the questions is always like the whole staff is black. And my mom will be like, yeah, like, yeah, everybody here is black. So my therapist will be black. Your therapist will be black. Like, yes. And there's black men there. And, it, and it's, it's just questions that people think like, I guess they think like, this is a dumb question or I shouldn't ask right. this question. And it's like, we have to allow people to feel safe asking a question. Like, how am I going to go into therapy and lay it all on the line when I don't even feel safe enough to ask a question to even get to the point that I'm considering therapy? And I think that, you know, um, a lot more therapists are just being open to just having conversations because if I have a conversation like this, right, like we have this conversation and someone sees myself or sees Norwood or, or you know, or sees you and they're, and they're like, oh, like that person was cool. Like that person's a therapist. It's like, we're, we're normal people. We're, we're a little off sometimes and you know like we have bad hair days and all the same issues you have we have anxiety i do not have bad have hair days no bad <laughs> hair days for you i fixed mine right before we got on right. um but you know it's it's like we are the normal people we we deal with mental illness some of us take a, you know anxiety medication ourselves you know some of us are therapists because we had trauma I, I, most of us let me say, are probably therapists because of our history and what we've been through or what we've seen. And, and a lot of people, you know, the, the same way we do with doctors, right? We put people on a pedestal and we forget that at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We all have a story. We all have an experience. We, you know, we just need to talk to each other. And I think that that's what's important is that we start to get to a point where we're just comfortable talking. And then we can get into the deeper, you know, resources about therapy and and what that looks like and you know what a diagnosis is and why we diagnose and you know how all of these things come into play after we've had a general conversation that I can even trust you enough to have a conversation with you let alone to tell you all my secrets mm -hmm. and I, I, I just think that that's the beginning of it absolutely um and you know I do I wanted to ask before we this has been such a great conversation and we'll continue it um, after the recording's over. But I did wanna ask, um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes someone with a suicidal ideation does follow, follow through on that. And that can be incredibly hard and difficult for their loved ones left behind. Um, you know, there's just a wide variety of, of feelings and thoughts behind it. And, you know, everybody has their own reason for why they, for why they go there. Um, but if you were, or I'm sure, you know, you have spoken to, to family, friends, loved ones who have had someone pass um, by suicide, what is something that you, or some things that you tell them to help deal with the grief during that period, during the loss of someone who, you know, cause I think it's one thing to lose someone in an accident or through health, or, but to lose someone by them taking their lives, I feel like even if people know it's not necessarily about them, I think there's a level of like, it feels so personal, like, why wasn't I enough for you to stay here? You know, you know, you have kids, you know, you have families or, you know, just whatever is going on in their lives, like, why wasn't that enough? And I know when I've had those conversations with people, I just try to explain it best as someone who's 
lived with it, lived with depression and how, you know, like when I'm going through it, it's that drowning feeling. And it's like, I'm swimming, trying to get to the surface. And sometimes you just get tired. Like you just want the sheer, like, it's not about your family. It's not about your friends. It's like the sheer release of like, just not having that constant everyday struggle of existing. Um, so that's sort of how I try to explain it just from the viewpoint of someone who's lived with it. Um, but what are some things that you talk to your clients or anyone in general who's lost someone um, by suicide? Um, Norwood, if you want to start. Yeah, it's actually interesting because um, you talked about, I'm going to kind of go back to what you talked about a little bit earlier about people coming to therapy and we offer tools and a lot of skills and this and that. And that can be true. I often don't speak in a lot of those times when people come to me with these situ these kind of uh, experiences. I've been in many. Um, what are the really most powerful things that that they're that 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 we do is it's a human thing. It's a very powerful human thing that we spend time practicing. Um, and it's something as simple as holding space. We hold the space. Um, there are some things that I say, and it really is always dependent on the, the person and situation because at the, in those spaces, it is so tender and so precious to uh, those folks. They're in, they're in the midst of the wound. You know, it's fresh and it's painful. I, I honor that space that they're in, even as they're surviving and may not even realize it. They've already survived, even beyond the wound. They're, uh, one of the things that I was asked this question, and I share this often, I thought it was a brilliant question. One of, the, one of my staff asked me in supervision, he was like, hey, what's the, is, is he asked me, is something, I don't know, forgiveness, a prerequisite for um, healing. I thought about it for a minute, maybe. I said, I think the only prerequisite for healing, the only prerequisite is the wound. But interestingly enough, healing is never, the body heals itself miraculously. And so we get to witness, we get to hold the space where healing happens. Some of the things that I've said to people um, are that is offer them an opportunity to share how they feel, to talk, and whether that sharing is through their body, weeping, screaming, punching, not me. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I have a, some people, some people need, you need to hit something. I have a thing in my office, hit it, hit it. What you're feeling is exactly what you're supposed to feel. If you didn't feel that pain, I'd be, that, I'd be a lot more concerned about you. I'd be a lot more concerned about you if you didn't feel the pain. And some people don't feel the pain and they and they may feel numb and that's how you feel how you process is your healing it has begun it has begun people feel guilt they want to fix it we're such great problem solvers you want to fix it if i only had yeah. i should have i could have said i don't stop that because people, we need the space to feel our feelings. If not, then when? If I'm feeling guilt, I can sit in front of it. And a part of it is that I'm able to sit in front of their big feelings to help them to sit in front of their big feelings rather than running away from it. Um, I'm thinking about a young man that I worked with who was 16, he slept in the basement he and, his old, he and his older brother slept in the basement of their house. They called it like their little uh, man cave. And that was like, you know, they were older, the oldest in the, in the family. And that was like kind of like their little uh, haven. And the older brother uh, completed a suicide. 
he was 17. And every night, the 16 year old would go to bed still in his bed, uh, right next to the empty bed of his brother. And folks were like, we don't understand why he's upset. I do. Yeah. Because he's human. And I think that there's a tremendous humanity that is revealed um, that when people are experiencing these things and to be able to hold that space where humanity happens is probably one of the most powerful gifts to allow and facilitate healing because people will heal as they need to in their own time. Um, and we can't direct it. Um, so I'm not really sure. There are probably some things that I've said. I can't really think of a, a lot of them other than, you know, it's it's okay. How you're feeling is exactly how you're supposed to feel. It's what you need. But, uh, I think that's one of the biggest things you can say because so often people apologize for their feelings. It's like, don't be, don't be sorry. Feel how you, how you, feel. How you feel. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're big feelings and they're, they can be overwhelming. And yeah. we get, if you, you sort of have a feeling about the feelings mm-hmm. and get afraid of the feelings or we want to judge our feelings. Mm-hmm. When feelings like your hair, it just, they come up, it comes out. Well, you know, uh, it, it just grows. They grow up. Yeah. One of the things we do we want to be mindful of is that when feelings kind of linger a little bit too long, they kind of stick around after their usefulness. That's when we want to be able to continue to hold the space. That's often where we may say, hey, you know what? But we may want to offer you some strategies or some tools or some other things because those feelings are lingering. But I think the first thing is, I think Chantel said it uh, really well, no one's going to come open up to me about the most painful thing that they've ever experienced that they don't want to face. Yet, and then come and bring it to me, and I'm afraid of their big feelings. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, and Chantel, did you have anything to add to that? No, no. I think Norwood, like he nailed it. Right? Yes. He nailed it. Yeah. I, I, I know. I think the first time someone, um, someone had lost their child, um to suicide and and I was sent to work with the family and I was like oh my goodness I'm like I don't know and, and I think at that time I had been I had been doing therapy for well over 10 years but that was like a, a situation where I was like this is something I always tried to avoid because I'm like I don't know what to say and what not to say and like Nora was said like it was one of those things like I in my mind I had this plan and uh, you know this is what I'm going to do and in the moment I was just like I'm, I'm here. I'm here with you. Um, and it was her and her and her daughter. And I was just like, as a mother, I don't even, I don't even know what to say that can give you comfort, but I'm here to support you. You know, let us know what you need. Let us know what you need for the, the children um, that you have at home. And that's kind of how we went with it for the time that she needed support where it's just like, you tell me what you need in these moments and and we can't even even begin to do you know the work until you get to a, a comfortable space with the situation and that takes a while and so you know you have to be patient and and you know um and explaining what mental illness is and i think that's the one of the hardest things is people don't understand that when when someone struggles with mental illness and you're aware of that. And then as a result of that, they're able to, you know, they get to a point where suicide was their choice, you know, at, at you know, to, to, to end their life was their choice at the end. It's like, you have to realize what they've been through. You've witnessed it, you've seen it, you know, for, for someone that they never had an issue and then it happens, it's like, oh my gosh, this is surprising. Like I never realized there was an issue, but for some people it's like, this person has struggled. I have watched this person struggle. I have been there. I have supported. I've given all the resources I could. 
and this was the end result. And so, you know, for the families that I've worked with, it's like mental illness was present. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it was known, it was present. It was, you know, they were trying to figure out ways to treat it. And, you know, that was the end result. And so for those families that just had to help them realize that you were dealing with someone that had a mental illness, and this is not something that, you know, may have went differently if things were done differently in any way, you know? So, you know, it's really hard to, to tell that to a mother because it's like, well, I, I, I should have forced one more therapist. And it's like, I feel like I'm a pretty good therapist, but, you know, as someone that um, has attempted suicide myself, there's nothing that anyone could have said to me in that moment that would have made a difference because in my mind, I had already created the situation. I had, I went through it. it. It made sense to me. I was, you know, like you said, I was overwhelmed and it was like, there's nothing anyone can say to me in this moment that's going to make a difference. Now, after I took the pills, something clicked. It was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> wait a minute. This is not, this is not the, you know, this is not what you should be doing. This can be worked out, but it was after the fact. So, and my thing is if I had chose something a little more lethal, then I, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it's, when you get to that point, it's just like, you, you just feel like your, your world is just much bigger than you and it's just it's too much it's just too much there there you can't get a handle on it and and being a black woman it you know um there is a lot of pressure for us to figure it out and be able to handle it and to be smart enough and to be strong enough and to be resourceful enough and you know and a lot of times we we have families we have communities we we have all of this stuff around us and sometimes it's not enough it, you know, it's, it's, it's just not the right thing at the right time and you, you get tired. And so, you know, as family members of people that have lost someone, you have to realize that sometimes people get to that point where nothing is going to be enough in that moment for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I thank you both so much and all of you joining as well for this conversation. I know that it's not easy, but it's definitely one that needs to happen. Uh, we're going to continue speaking with the recording off, but for those of you who are viewing this um, on YouTube or at a later time, uh, please be aware that 741, 741 is the National Crisis Text Hotline. Um, next July, you'll be able to use 988, which will be nice that that has been approved. Um, if you are in the Wilmington area, um, there is Sean's house, uh, which is in Newark, and it's open to any young person between the ages of 14 to 24. Uh, their number is 800-273-8255. And you can always go to NAMI Delaware. Uh, they have resources available as well. There's the um, crisis doc and different things um, that are available. So help is out there if you are struggling or if you feel that someone near you is struggling, um, please reach out to, to get help. Uh, I know Chantel also mentioned that some, you know, you often will see the, oh, and I apologize, that number is actually for the suicide prevention hotline. So that 800 number is the suicide prevention hotline and that's available for you. And then um, there's also 800-969-4357, which is the Child Priority Response Service. Um, so there's different uh, resources available. Oh, and I was just saying, you know, I know Chantal mentioned that sometimes uh, there are those signs because someone is struggling, you can see it for a long time, but sometimes it's your happy friends too. I know when I'm going through it, I'm especially, like, I don't want anyone to ask me if I'm dealing with anything because I know I will break down if they do. So I just smile and I, you know, pretend like everything's okay. But I know that something is going on inside. So if you know that something is going on inside, you can call, um, you can reach out to the text line I mentioned, you can call the resources. Um, there's also an adult mobile crisis line that you can call in Delaware, which is 800-652-2929. Um, so help is out there, please know that. Um, and please know however you're struggling, um, there's someone who, wants to talk to you and wants to help you in any way. So please don't hesitate 
uh, to reach out. Thank you.